Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit would lead us and guide us as a church, as a ministry, as the body of Christ. Lord, not just for this church, but every church worldwide that belongs to you, Father. Lord, I pray that we would be in unity with your Spirit, that we would be oneness in your love, that we would be united by one common purpose, one goal. And that is, Lord, to, Lord, to know you as Lord and Savior and to fulfill the Great Commission. Lord, help us, for the earth is almost ripe. We thank you. In the name of Jesus, our Lord, we pray. Amen. The message this morning is entitled, The Earth is Ripe. Now, I would like to speak to you today about what it means to be a Christian as we draw near to the end of this age, the church age. The responsibility that God has put on every child of his, every Bible-believing Christian. I'm going to look at some scripture, and we're going to go quickly through these things. In Matthew chapter 13, verse 24 through 30, and then 36 through verse 43, I want to read to you what it means about a harvest. There is a harvest that is coming. There is a harvest, a harvest of, of, of righteousness and a harvest of judgment. The Bible speaks clear about this. We see all the injustices that are happening in the world today. There are some that are legit. They are there. They are real. And God will deal with them in his time. And then there are some that people claim are there that are injustices that are really not there. And it's false, false flag, false news, whatever you want to call that. But regardless, we have a lot of issues today in the world, a lot of social issues. That's what they call them, social issues. And if the church gets completely wrapped in these social issues, the church, every Christian who does this, will get lost and forget the true purpose of why, not only why they were saved, but why they are still alive on this earth. And that is what I want to talk about, the true purpose of a Christian. Because of the coming harvest of righteousness, the coming harvest of judgment, the earth is almost ready. As a matter of fact, Scripture says that at one time in, the, in our future, that there will be a voice from heaven that will say, the earth is ripe, it is ready. So let, let's, let's understand first that word ripe. The word ripe means to develop to the point of readiness for harvesting or eating. To develop to the point of readiness for harvesting or eating. That's what ripe means. It's ready, right? You, my, my wife has planted uh, some trees around here, and uh, she keeps looking at this pear tree for the past couple of years. It's growing. And uh, she told me yesterday, <laughs> she made me laugh because I love pears. I love pears more than apples. She loves apples. She's an apple, and I'm a pear. And uh, we were talking yesterday while we were eating lunch. She goes, you know, I went to that tree. And she, she probably didn't think I was listening, but I was listening. You know, most guys don't listen all the time. Say amen, men. Amen. All right. Well, women, I didn't tell you all to say amen. I just said the men. <laughs> and so uh, she went to that tree, and she saw two, a couple of them. And she said, so she shook that tree. It's not ripe. It's not ready yet. She's, she's, she's excited about just a couple of them getting ready to show up on her tree. It, the tree's, I don't know, seven, eight foot tall. It's not that big of a tree, maybe a little bit bigger than that. It's growing. It's in its youth. And, uh, it, you know, if the Lord tarries and don't come anytime soon, another 20, 30 years, that tree will be big, but we'll probably be underneath that tree by then. I don't know. But uh, one, if the Lord don't come, those trees will one day be ripe with fruit. Amen. Are we ripe? Are we ready to meet the Lord? Is the earth ready? Let's read. Jesus says in Matthew 13, verse 24, Another parable he put forth them, saying, The kingdom of heaven, remember that, the kingdom of heaven, he's speaking about heaven, is like a man who sowed good seed in his field. But while men slept, that's the church, his enemy came and sowed tares among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares, that means wheat, 
I mean uh, weeds, weeds, also appeared. Verse 27. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow good seed in your field? How then does it have tares, weeds? He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Do you want us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the weeds, the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Let both grow together until the harvest. And at the time of harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather together the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Verse 36. Then Jesus sent the multitude away and went into the house, and his disciples came to him, saying, Explain to us the parable of the tares of the field. He answered and said to them, He who sows the good seed is the Son of Man. That's him. The field is the world. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom. That's you and I, church. But the tares are the sons of the wicked one. The enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. And therefore, as the tares are gathered and burned in the fire, so it will be at the end of this age. The Son of Man will send out his angels, and they will gather out of his kingdom all things that offend and those who practice lawlessness, and will cast them into the furnace of fire. There will be wailing and gnashing of teeth, then the righteous will shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who has ears to hear, let him hear. And if you know Garcia men, Garcia men have big ears to hear. Now you're going to be looking at my ears, the rest of this message. My grandfather had ears twice as big as mine. I'm kidding. But they were big. But it's not talking about physical ears. It's talking about the spiritual are you understanding? Do you have the Spirit of God in you? Are you desiring to know the things of God that are about to fall upon this earth? Do you even care? Do you have a sense of understanding that this is only a temporary situation you're in? Please hear me out. This world will not last, and you will not last in this world forever. Are you, are you struggling with, with an with a, a, a sickness that no doctor can cure? Are you struggling with things that just you keep praying and they, they, just, they just keep getting worse, but you're keeping your faith? Just be still and wait upon the Lord. One day, God will gather you because of the righteousness in you, church, because of your faith in Christ alone, because you repented of your sin, because you asked Jesus to be the Lord and Savior of your life. Because of these things, because you, you have a hope, because you have a faith, because you have a perseverance, because you've learned from your failures and your victories, you keep going forward. And God, is, God has his eye on you. And God is looking for you. And God knows where you are. He knows where you live. He knows your number. Amen? He knows everything about you. You don't need to keep uh, updating your information with God. Amen? They sent me a... Uh, I subscribed to a sub subscription online and they sent me a thing. Uh, your billing information needs to be updated because I recently received a new bank card. And so uh, I had to make sure I updated that information so that way when it comes time uh, to pay, I'll continue to have that subscription. Well, you don't have to worry about that with God. God already paid for it on the cross and he knows you. And he's following you. He, 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 his very breath is in you. He breathed on you. As Jesus breathed on the disciples in John chapter 20, he breathed on them. He said, receive the Holy Spirit. That was the first time God breathed on man since the days of Adam. When God breathed on Adam and he became a living being. God knows you. And one day God is coming for you to be in his barn, in his house. Now, that this is a story of the wheat and the weeds. And there are a lot of weeds in this world. I'm talking about people who reject God, whether willingly or, or unknowingly. 
They love evil. They're bound by evil. They're bound by depression. They're bound by sickness, uh, spiritual sicknesses. They're just bound by unbelief. They're bound by doubt. And sadly, these people are known as weeds, tares. But that is where God has sowed a seed into you and you became alive to Christ. You became a wheat. You became a seed for you to go out into the world and to tell others as others told you about how you can be forgiven of your sin and how you can be adopted into the family of God. It's time, church, to understand that that is all your life as a Christian is about. You have a job. You have families to raise. You have things to do. But it should always be centered around the building of the kingdom of God. Amen? Amen. Say amen. Amen. <clears throat> In Matthew 9, 37 through 38, it says this. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Therefore, pray the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. Look at that scripture. <clears throat> Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. The harvest is the gathering of the godly and the ungodly. Jesus is in charge of that. The angels, as the scripture we just previously read, the angels said, do you want us to go and deal with this wicked right now? <laughs> you see how they love God? And they can't even stand for wickedness in God's creation. Angels telling God, do you want us to go take care of this? Because why? Because we can, Lord. You know we can. The Bible says that in the Old Testament, one angel with the swing of his sword, 185,000 men lay dead. Just with one angel. The Lord said, no, 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 wait. They're going to grow up together. And at the end of the age, the church age, the end of the tribulation age, the end of the millennial age, at the end of the age period, God will separate them. We're coming close to the end of the church age where the, the work of the church will be finished, complete, Amen. Some of you are tired. Some of you are in broken down physical bodies, but your spirit is strong. Keep your eyes on Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of the harvest. And he says that the world is full of people who need to know him, who need to be saved. Look at that scripture, verse 37 and 38. Look at 37. The harvest is plentiful. It's truly plentiful. The world is filled with wicked. But the laborers, the Christians are few. They say to, now, 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 look, I want you to keep that scripture up. Statistics say that the biggest faith in the world is what? Christianity. But Jesus says in scripture, the workers are few. Every Christian is to be a worker. Jesus says the, word, the laborers are few. When man, statistics are saying, uh, statistics are saying that the church of Christ is the biggest faith in the world, two billion, three billion people of Christians in the world, please listen to this. Who's lying? Who's wrong in their information? Jesus says that laborers are few. God is always faithful. There will always be a remnant of his people on the earth. But the world is lying. There may not be a lot of us in the world, but the world is not mightier than us. Because Jesus says that the gates of hell shall not prevail against the church. And because Christ is in us, greater is he that is in us than he who is in the world. So the few of us, like the Marine Corps, the few, the proud, the Marines, like the Marines, we are a few. The Marine Corps is the smallest military branch of the United States government. Uh, how many soldiers? Approximately 185? 187,000 around they keep? But yet they're the tip of the spear of the military sword. They're mighty. You know, I saw a documentary one time. It said, 
uh, whenever there's something that happens and the military has to get involved, the Marines are the first to go and the last to know. They go in first, and they just pretty much, they apprehend, they seize control of the dominating force. They go and they pave the way. And then the army will come in and occupy. They're taught differently. Marines are taught to take down, to apprehend, to change things. And the army is taught to occupy, to maintain after what the Marines already did. I'm not saying nothing negative about the army at all. They are all very important. But it's funny how we all have a certain job to do. And in the Church of Christ, we all have a certain job to do. Not all of you can play an instrument or teach a Sunday school class or are able to greet the, at the front door or are able to be a prayer warrior, prayer partner, or able to preach. But we all have a job to do in the body of Christ. All of us. Every single one of us, no matter how young or how old you are, what is your calling? What is your anointing? Jesus said, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out laborers into his harvest. We are to pray that we may be sent out. What did Isaiah say? Lord, send me. Here I am. Here I am. Send me, Lord. We have to have the right attitude first. Number one, we have to have the right attitude towards God and towards people. A lot of people don't want to go into, uh, Christians don't want to do anything because they don't have a right attitude towards the people. Remember Jonah? If you don't have the right attitude towards people, apparently you don't have the right attitude really towards God. You need to check your relationship with God. So the earth is soon to be harvested. The earth is soon to be harvested for righteousness and for judgment. Now, in Revelation chapter 14, verse 14 through 16, <clears throat> this is in our future. Let me read this to you. It's a, it's, a, it's a prophetic event. Then I looked, says John, and behold, a white cloud, and on the cloud sat like one, the Son of Man. This is in the future, our future today. Having a, on his head a golden crown, and in his hand a sharp sickle. And another angel came out of the temple, crying with a loud voice to him who sat on the cloud. He said to Christ, Thrust in your sickle and reap, for the time has come for you, for you, Jesus, to reap. Jesus said, he's the Lord of the harvest, amen? For the harvest of the earth is ripe, it's ready, the earth is ready. So he who sat on the clouds thrust in his sickle on the earth, and the earth was reaped. Look at Revelation 6, 9 through 11. I'm going to go there in just a moment, but turn your Bible there. But as I recap Revelation 14, 14 through 16, this recalls a future event that will happen. John saw, John in our past saw what will happen in our future today. The Lord will bring a harvesting of the righteous and the unrighteous. It's coming. In Revelation 6, 9 through 11, it says, When John had opened, uh, when the Lord Jesus had opened the fifth seal, John says, I saw under the altar the souls of those who had been slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice. Have you ever noticed that? Not, even an, not only angels, but even people that are in heaven cry out with a loud voice. They cried with a loud voice saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, until you judge and avenge our blood on those who dwell on the earth? Then a white robe was given to each of them, and it was said to them that they should rest a little while longer until both the number of their fellow servants and their brethren who would be killed as they were was completed. There is a certain number of believers that only God knows that will come into heaven. There is an exact number of people that only God knows that are going to be damned to the eternal lake of fire forever. God knows that number exactly. And he knows the calculations you look at the stock market, the number's always going up and down, up and down. It don't do that with God, heaven and earth. And one day, the Father will tell the Son, He'll tell the angels, it's ready. And the Lord Jesus Christ, from heaven, from His throne, by a mighty move of His hand, He will call in the harvest of the earth. Where will you be? 
you watching online, will you be harvested for righteousness or for judgment? These souls in Revelation 6, 9 through 11, these were people who had been killed because of their faith in Christ. Their, their souls had been up to heaven, together with all who are in Christ who die and go to be with the Lord. They were up in heaven at a, at a point in our future. The scripture is saying that there's a cry in heaven calling for to be avenged. You know, they're, they're calling out to the Lord in heaven, Lord, judge the earth. Judge the earth, Lord. That's the cry of believers in heaven today. I mean, it's right there in scripture. They want Jesus to judge the earth. They want Jesus to bring in the righteous. Because I do believe that when you get to heaven, and now watch this, please. Now, somebody may not agree with this, but this is my opinion right here. I'll always tell you what my opinion is and what the Bible says. But I'm under the opinion that when you get to heaven as a believer, your knowledge is going to increase a lot more. You're going to understand why this happened, why that happened, you're going to understand what really happened to JFK, what really happened to Elvis, if he's still alive or not. You're going to have a, a clarity about a lot of things, guys. Now, it's okay to agree to disagree. You may not agree with that. But a lot of clarity is going to come to you. Because these souls that are in heaven apparently had a clarity. You know, for a lot of people, we, we're, we're all, the, the, in the church, for the most part, we're like, well, you know, we just, we got to get along. We got to be accepting of others' lifestyles when we know that that lifestyle sends them to an eternal place of separation. Now, we're not called to be damning and point the finger and say, you're going to hell. That will never win nobody to Christ. It didn't win you to Christ, did it? Yeah. You can't live like that as a Christian on this earth. You know how you witness to somebody? By being transparent and by being truthful with the Lord. Because if you can be like that with the Lord Jesus Christ, then you'll be like that with people. And God will always get his way. with. If you're, not, if you're being a disobedient child of God, he will expose you. At one point in your life, he will. And if you don't get it right, he will show for who you are. Because he loves you, God disciplines those he loves. Amen? Every good father and mother knows this. You can't not fool God and you cannot fool the church. Because we as children of God on the earth, we are called to hear what the Spirit is saying. And we just know when things aren't right. We may not know right there and then, but when we see people, when we see a situation, when we see how the nation's going, we just know in our heart when something's not right. Because we're hearing. We may not have all the clarity and all the details, but we know there's a great move of God coming. We know that, that chairs in heaven are moving around. Amen? We know that, that, that the, the, the glasses on the, on the banquet table are, are, are moving. Or, you know when glasses hit each other? You know, we're getting ready to have a great wedding banquet in heaven. The whole church is going to be there. Can you hear the preparations? But that's the cry in heaven as well. They are ready for this to be done with. But as we are on the earth, we have a mission to go out to preach and to live the gospel that one soul may be saved. At least one, at least one, Lord. They made fun of that soldier. True story in World War II of a man who would not pick up a rifle because he believed it was against his faith. And yet he was trained as a medic and he saved countless lives and, and he, was, he was awarded. You don't earn you are awarded, I believe, right? Is that right? You're awarded the Medal of Honor. He was, they gave him the Medal of Honor because he had saved so many lives. But he said that he kept saying, Lord, just give me one more. 
he kept going back onto the battlefield looking for one more, looking for one more. Lord, just give me one more, Lord. And I don't know how many he got, but he got a ton of them. A lot of people live today because their daddies were saved by that man. Because that man had in his heart to understand the value of life. The, 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 the understand the devotion that God has towards people. And if we will approach our Christian walk like that, there's a battle going on today. It's raging in the world. It begins first with your family. Fight for your family first. And don't ever give up. It's easy. I've, I've been there. Sometimes you just want to give up. But you fight for your family. And then God will allow you to expand your battlefield as you fight for others as well. Because your faith will begin to grow. And you begin to take on more responsibilities in the kingdom of God. God's speaking to some people right now. And so, in Hebrews 10, 24 through 25, I want you to understand something. We lose a lot of... It's hard to find encouragement today as a Christian. Amen? You can find it when you come to church, and you can find it when you're in your walk with Christ, when you're alone with Him. In Hebrews 10, 24 through 25... Listen to every word that we're about to read. And let us consider the church. Let the church understand how to stimulate one another to love and good deeds. Well, now, we're not saved by our good works. But we are called by Scripture to help each other, to grow, to, to encourage each other towards love and good deeds. Look at the next verse not forsaking our own assembling together. Meaning, don't stop coming to church. There's an importance. Look at that. Not forsaking our own assembling together, as it is in the habit of some, but encourage one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Now just leave that up for a moment, please. A lot of people in church come when they feel like it. There, there's a difference between those kind of people and the people who come because they know their God has called them to come. What a mighty move of God the church will see. Not only when Sunday is full, but when prayer is full. When any type of fellowship, when, whenever this church is open and you're here, you bring encouragement. Because look at that. But encouraging one another as you see the day. What day? It could be the day at the end of your life. It could be the day of the coming of Jesus Christ. It could be the day of the har harvest of the earth. But there is a day that is coming as it draws near. We should be about coming together, encouraging each other in love and good works, because this is where we find encouragement. When the church comes together, Scripture says we are encouraged. When we are walking with Jesus, praying to Jesus, we, are to ha we have encouragement. Now, here's what I know. If you don't find it, if you don't find encouragement in the church, if you don't understand that you can get encouragement in the church, most likely you don't even have encouragement from your walk with Jesus. Because if you knew how much encouragement you get in your walk with Jesus, then you'll understand because the Lord will direct you to go and get more encouragement. A good doctor does that. A good doctor will say, I'm going to help you with this ailment, but there's another specialist that I'm going to refer you to and if you go, you're going to be made well. Amen? So doctors work like that. And so that's what the good doctor is saying. I, I, I can take care of all of this, but I'm going to direct you to do some things that you may be out of your comfort zone. You may not like being around other people, but you, and you may not because you've been tired. You've been doing this and you've been doing that. You, you, you may have bitten off more than you can chew. Every situation can be different, guys. But it is biblical. We find encouragement when we are in the fellowship of the church. Now, I don't know about anyone here, but I need encouragement. Amen? I need encouragement. As we see the day drawing near, the battles are becoming more and more severe. Now, the enemy hates your anointing. Now, we are all called as Christians to go out 
and to fulfill the gospel. We are to preach the gospel so that souls may be saved. You have an anointing to do this, but remember this, whatever your anointing is, and everyone it's different, but whatever your anointing is, the devil will come against you. Look at 1 Samuel 19, 9 through 10. David, as a young man, King David had a beautiful anointing. You know what it was? Playing that guitar. I'm kidding. It was like a stringed instrument. I don't know what they called it then. Wasn't alive. What was that? A harp? Somebody said harp? It was a stringed instrument, and he knew it. And King Saul was tormented by demonic spirits. The Lord allowed these demonic spirits to come to King Saul and torment him because King Saul was in disobedience. But King David, went the king at the time, young David had an anointing of God. He was a virtuoso in his instrument. He spent a lot of time alone in the fields watching his dad's flock. So he had this instrument. He knew songs. He knew how to sing to God. He knew how to praise God. It was an anointing. Amen? And so they called David to go and play songs for Saul, and it would soothe Saul. But eventually, over time, Saul began to resent the calling of David because the wicked man Saul saw God in David. And that's how today you may have a calling. You may show up at a job. They may like you. They see you're a person of peace, of love, of joy. But after a while, they begin to hate you because they truly, they don't understand. I mean, they understand that they don't have what you have because they know then that because of your relationship with Jesus. And they're reminded of that decision that they have to make and they want to run from it. Look at this in verse 9. Now, the distressing spirit from the Lord came upon Saul as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing music with his hand. Then Saul sought to pin David to the wall with his spear, but he slipped away from Saul's presence, and he drove the spear into the wall. So David fled and escaped that night. David did not run because he was afraid. David was allowed by God to flee. Look, some of us in the near future, Christian, we're going to have to start running like David. And it's not because we fear man, but the church is going to be going underground one day. The church is going to have to be on the run one day. Because you know why? That's how the church was born. In the book of Acts, the church was on the run. In the book of Acts, when the church first began, they were on the run. They were under persecution. And the way they, the church was born is the way the church is going to end. And they flourished under persecution. We're not under persecution. We're not flourishing. God wants us to flourish. He's going to turn up the heat a little bit. The harvest is coming. It's time to get real with Jesus Christ. Now, Romans 10, 14 through 15 says this. Paul says, How then shall they call on him, on Jesus, in whom they have not believed? How shall people know Jesus, the one they have not believed in? How should they truly understand what Jesus did? Oh, look, look, all people know about in the world about Jesus is that he's that guy on the cross like this. That's all they know. They don't know why he does that. They don't know why. He's, they don't know why, who he is. That's what Jesus even said. Father, forgive them. They don't know their left hand from their right hand. And this is what Paul is saying. He says, and how shall they, the people, believe in him, Jesus, of whom they have not heard? And how shall they, how shall they hear without a preacher? Every Christian is a preacher. And how shall they preach unless they are sent? We've been sent. As it is written, how beautiful are the feet of those who preach the gospel of peace, who bring glad tidings of good things. It, when you walk into a room, Christian, you, you, you bring the gospel of peace. Sadly today, churches are, are filled with people who don't know the gospel of peace. Let that be different about Grace Christian Center. Let that be different about you and your own personal walk with Christ. Please, I plead with you. I beg you, please, everyone, everyone, man to their, to their own faith. Don't look at who, what, who this one's doing and what that one's doing. Pay attention to you and your faith. Are you a cheerful giver of your money, of your time, of your talent? Are you a cheerful giver to God? Are you faithful? Honor him. Honor him. God is faithful to those who are faithful to him. And even to those who are not faithful to him, God is still faithful to those. And finally, I'll take you through Jonah. 
I want to look at Jonah. But Romans does say, beautiful are the feet of those who bring the gospel. Look at your feet. You know what Forrest Gump said about feet? And I know it's fake. It's not a real character. But in the movie, Forrest Gump said, Mama always said, you can tell a lot about a person by the shoes they wear. Even the world understands things like that. We've worn a lot of shoes. <laughs> We've worn a lot, of, a lot of hats, a lot of responsibilities. But there's only one that matters. John the Baptist looked at the, 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 the shoes of Jesus and John the Baptist said, I am not even worthy to untie his sandal strap. And Jesus has called us to fill those shoes. Jesus said, I did great works, but you will do even greater works. That's what Jesus said in the gospel. We are called to fill his shoes. Jesus was faithful, a good steward of all time, talent, and treasure. Evaluate your walk with Christ today. Are you faithful? Now be very careful because you can fall into a religious mindset. Oh, I do this. I give this amount of money. I give this amount of time. I do this. But you have not love. You have not a care for people who are lost. You still have unforgiveness in your heart to somebody that totally wronged you. Check yourself. Unforgiveness is, is more deadlier than cancer. All the cancers combined in the world, unforgiveness is more deadlier. Yes. Jonah was a prophet of God. Verse 1, Jonah 1.1. 1, 1. It says, Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, the son of Amittai, saying, Arise, every Christian should arise. Go to Nineveh, that great city, and cry out against it. We should cry out against this world today for their wickedness. Jonah was called to do this. For their wickedness has come up before me. But Jonah, verse 3, arose and fled to Tarshish in the, from the presence of the Lord. He went down to Joppa, found a ship going to Tarshish. So he paid the fare. He went down into it. And he went to Tarshish away from the presence of the Lord. But the Lord sent out the great wind on the sea. And there was a mighty tempest on the sea. So that the ship was about to be broken up. Jonah was running from God. And if you're running from God, things are not going to go well for you, believer. Why is this happening to me? Why is there anger in my life? Why is there no peace? I have no peace. I can go into the church. I can sing the song. I can even raise my hand, but I have no peace. Have you ever considered you might be running from God? You might be on a cruise ship thinking, you know, life is going to be a little bit better if I just do it this way. But the Lord is saying, no, 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 no. I'm going to get your attention, son, daughter. But I just want to sit in my lazy boy. I don't want to do anything but watch Andy Griffith. I'm preaching about myself now. I'm tired, Lord. If you only knew, God, if you only knew. And the Lord says, go, arise and go out. Be a part of something greater than yourself. Encourage others who need it. But Lord, I need it. I know. You will be encouraged as you encourage others. Duh. Yeah. But Lord, I need to be encouraged first. Well, now you're being selfish. I know. So arise and go. <sighs> you see? A repetition. God's not going to move. You're not going to move God. You're not going to move God from his righteous stance. He is not going to, okay, I'll let you bend this a little. Okay, you can compromise a little with it. No, God is standing still because he is the way, the truth, and the life. We must understand that we have to change. Insanity means doing the same thing over and over, expecting a different result. So Jonah said, I'm on the ship. People want to kill me because they all know I'm a prophet. So throw me overboard. I'll just die. Some people would rather die than be obedient to God. And I'm talking about his people. I'm talking about his children. I'd rather die, God, than to do what you're telling me to do. I'm not doing this. 
God says, oh, you're not going to die. You're going to wish you were dead. You think you wish you died now? Okay. So verse 15 in Jonah 1, verse 15. So they picked up Jonah and threw him into the sea, and the sea ceased from its raging. Then the men feared the Lord exceedingly and offered a sacrifice to the Lord and took vows. These guys came to know God Almighty by throwing the prophet out the boat. (laughs) When disobedience is dealt with in the life of a Christian, people can get saved. Oh, you didn't hear that, did you? You could be living in disobedience, Christian. But even when others call your disobedience out and they see that God is working in your life, others are watching and and they're going to say, whoa, there is, whoa, God is. My goodness, the wind stopped. Oh my goodness, he's in the water, now the wind stopped. Translate that into many situations throughout the church today. Through the disobedience of many, people come to salvation. Even the disobedience of his sons and daughters. God's going to have his way. And in Jonah 2 verse 1, Jonah was swallowed by a fish. It it was at the end of verse 1. I'm I'm sorry, Jonah 1.17. I don't have that up there. But in Jonah 1.17, it says, Now the Lord prepared a great fish to swallow Jonah. And Jonah was in the belly of the fish three days and three nights. God prepared a, a, a big whale. You could say, God, is there, did you prepare a well for me? I don't want to be in a well, God. Lord, well, what have you prepared to design for me, Lord? You know, you can get afraid, right? I mean, who wanted to be in the belly of a well? This literally happened. It was symbolic of what Jesus would do years later. Jonah, uh, Jesus would be in the grave three days and three nights. But he rose from the dead. Jonah, basically in Jonah chapter 2, it's the prayer of Jonah. Verse 1, Then Jonah prayed to the Lord his God from the fish's belly. Even though Jonah was disobedient, he knew who his God was. And he cried out to God. He said, Lord, and I'm not going to read all of the prayer. You can read it today in your own prayer time, in your own study time. But God heard him. And, there, and let me just tell you, by the way, verse one, uh, 2 through 9 has so many doctrinal teachings about life, death, hell, and eternity. It is a deep well of treasure. Just letting you know. But that's not what I'm preaching on right now. In verse 10, So the Lord spoke to the fish, and it vomited Jonah unto the dry land. Where did Jonah end up? Look at Jonah 3, verse 1. Now the word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. God speak to you once. If that's not good enough, he'll speak a second time. Don't let God speak to you a third time. You know, you have a good daddy, a good mama. They said, don't make me tell you again. My dad never had to tell me twice. He just looked at me. I already knew it. My mom, she could tell me 20 times. And I just knew I can get away with so much with my mom. But when the dad, no. And that's the way most his Mexican dads were. I guess, you know, I mean, you don't want to mess with that. I mean, you know, I mean, it was tough growing up, right? For, for Hispanics. But back in the day, life was hard. And, you know, daddy already frustrated <laughs> by this and that. You're going to put a kid in, in place? I'm going to give it to you. I don't have time for this. I mean, they did the best they could with what they had. But our father in heaven is perfect. And God is telling Jonah, I'm telling you one more time. Look at this. The word of the Lord came to Jonah a second time. Verse 2. He says, Arise, go to Nineveh, that great city, and preach to it the message that I tell you. Now, we have a message. It's the gospel of Jesus Christ. We are to get up like Jonah, and we are to go into Nineveh, a great city. We are to preach it. Live. You know, preach the gospel at all times and when necessary, use words. You preach the gospel by the way you live your life. And once that opens the door, then you begin to tell them with your mouth about Jesus. Amen? I look, I look for those times where I can meet a stranger and talk to them about Jesus. 
I, I look forward to those things. I, I just love that. I do. I love it. Verse 3, so Jonah arose and went to Nineveh according to the word of the Lord. Now Nineveh was an exceedingly great city, a three-day journey in extent. It took three days to go through this city. And Jonah began to enter the city on the first day's walk. And he cried and said, 40 days and Nineveh shall be overthrown. And you know how Jonah said it? He was like, 40 days and y'all guys are dead. That's how he was saying it, actually. He didn't want to be there. He didn't like these people. There was a bad rift between the Ninevites and Jonah's people, the Jews. There's a bad a racial rift, nation against nation, race against race. Always been, it always will be there. And look, if a Christian has racism in their heart, it, it, it's bad, and God will deal with it. But personally, and, I, and if the Lord allows me, I will be speaking about this next Sunday, if the Lord allows me. But I will just share my personal opinion with you right now, real quickly. A lot of what we see happening in the streets of America and the, United, the world is a lot of nonsense. And there is a greater ulterior motive at work behind the scenes. And we're going to be in that, if the Lord allows me, next Sunday. It's all up to Him. I don't know. I don't even know if I'm going to finish this message. I may drop dead and die. I don't know. Now, going back to this. So verse 5. Jonah is preaching. He's probably once judged judgment on these people. He's been in the belly of a whale three days. God told him, get up and go. We're still, he's still fighting God. Some of us are still fighting God. Verse 5, so the people of Nineveh believed God, proclaimed a fast, and put on sackcloth from the greatest to the least of them. Everybody did. Everybody believed the message of the Lord given through Jonah. You know, you're complaining. These people are wicked. Man, they're so stupid. Don't they understand what they're doing is dumb? Look, alter, ulterior gender, transgenderism, all this ulterior lifestyle, all this blah, blah, blah. No, oh, man, they don't know how to do that. They're, what are they thinking? Well, they don't know because nobody's told them. Well, yeah, they know. How do you know they know? How do you really know they know? They may have heard. But have you ever heard of the scripture where Jesus says that the, the seed has fallen and the enemy comes and birds come and grab it real quickly? Somebody may come into a church and hear the gospel for the first time, but as soon as they're out, the devil has stolen it from their mind and they forget all over again. So the people claim a fast. How, how did they even know what a fast meant? That what... What, what, what was, how did they even know what a biblical fast was? These were people who did not know God. They did not know Jehovah God. But yet, they understood the importance of a fast. Christians don't even understand the importance of fasting today. Fast for 24 hours, water only. Do it. And, do, and spend that time with Jesus. Call your job. Say, you know, I'm not going to be here for two days. And, and lock yourself in the room. Be in prayer. Be in the word. Get your cell phone out of there and just do a 24-hour fast with God. But these people knew. In verse 10, then God saw their works, that they turned from their evil way. And that's what God wanted Jonah to do. Go and tell them so that they would turn away from evil. And God relented from the disaster that he had said he would bring upon them, and, he, and he did not, God did not do it. God doesn't want to bring disaster upon the world, but he is going to have to judge the world. Jonah 4, verse 1. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, and he became angry. Who was he angry with? He was, was he angry with God who saved the people? See, I think that's why a lot of people in church, they're stuck on themselves. Now, now, just watch this. For the most part, I, 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 and it's in the 80% range. Most of the church in America today, their messages are centered on the prosperity of the individual. Look at their sermons. Pay close attention. They'll use some scripture, but the scripture is twisted to where the pro, it's about prosperity about the individual. It's not about looking at what sin does 
and the purpose of the Great Commission and, and to go and to be a servant to others. Jesus said, I came to serve, not to be served. So when you're filled Sunday after Sunday with that type of message, you, you don't understand the call of God in your life. You may confess Christ, but you have received the perverted message of the gospel. And therefore, when God calls you to do something, you'll be in disobedience like Jonah. Jonah was a prophet, but he was in disobedience to God. And for the most part, a lot of the church is in disobedience to God. They have the office. They have the right. They have the resources. But they're in disobedience. They have the ability to hear God. They have the ability to speak and people will get saved. And even so, you'll see some churches today that will speak the biblical message. People get saved. But that preacher, that church in the core is still in disobedience to God. Because after people got saved, guess what? The preacher was still wrong in his heart. This is a life lesson for me personally. You can preach the gospel, the message that God gives you, but still not be right in your heart. And over the past many, many months, and I, I have had to look at myself. And just because, oh, you've been serving in the church this long, preaching, it's all well, it's just cruise control from here on out. you got to hate cruise control. you got to want to hate cruise control in your life. And you got to be willing to say, okay, Lord, I want to change, but I don't know where to change. And it's going to be an ugly process, Lord. But I don't want to get into a bell, a, well, a bell, belly of a whale. Amen? And I don't want to be angry anymore. You know, who gets tired of being angry? you got to want to be tired of getting angry. Angry at yourself, angry at God, angry at people. Just angry. Lord, I'm just angry. I, Lord, I... You're in disobedience. God has not given you a spirit of fear. He's not given you a spirit of confusion. Anger, frustration, depression, always quick to get upset. Those things are not from God. Man, and we got to recognize these things and we got to say, Lord, I know this is not right. Lord, I know my name's written in your book. Lord, I know I'm on my way to heaven. But this is not right, Lord. And, and this needs to be dealt with because I'm, 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 I'm a misery to people. So God begins a long conversation with him. And God pretty much tells him, I saved 120,000 people. And all you could think about it was this stupid little tree that don't give you shade over your head. I'm just reading in between the, this chapter. Jonah said, it's hot. I'm tired. I'm just going to sit right here. I'm going to die. And he found a little tree a little, with a little bit of shade. And so he, he's there. He's got shade. The next day it dies. And he's angry about that. And look in verse 11. Verse 10, I'm sorry. The tree died. Little plant. And verse 10, but the Lord said, you have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow which came up in a night and perished in a night see he, Jonah was a worker he didn't do anything about that plant he didn't grow that plant he didn't harvest that plant but that plant was just there and it gave him shade but then overnight it died and he was mad he was angry and look at verse 11 and God says and should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much livestock? End of the book of Jonah right there. It ends with a question mark. This, the book of Jonah ends with a question mark, with a question. You're concerned about everything else, child of God. You're concerned about this. You have plans to do this and plans to do that, but you're not concerned about these people in the world who are on their way to an eternal lake of fire? That doesn't bother you? That doesn't concern you?
If it did, your prayers would be different. If it did, your attitude would be different. You would understand that when we simply come together for a prayer meeting, we can move mountains. I believe the prayer services at Grace Christian Center are getting a lot done. We come together, we write down what needs to be prayed for, and we simply begin to pray. We take it to God by faith, and that's it. There's no, there's no lights, camera action. There's no jumping up and down, screaming and hollering. We just come together and pray. It's faith. faith. That's all God wants. That's all God requires. The prayer meeting should be the most successful, important thing a church does, period. The prayer meeting. Leonard Ravenhill said, a prayerless church is a powerless church. And that goes for every individual as well, every Christian as well. If you don't know how to pray, if you're not praying, you don't have much power either. Your faith will be small. Your faith will one day be diminished when you face the devils that you've never faced before. And let me tell you something, church. There are devils out there that you, that you never even thought existed. And I'm telling you, they are great. They are mighty, and they are very powerful. They are very persuasive. They know what to say, when to say, and how to say it. But we have the Spirit of God who can crush the plans of the enemy, who can extinguish every flaming arrow that comes to you. We have a God in heaven who is never asleep. He never slumbers. He's never weak. He's never frail. He cannot fall. He cannot falter. He is mighty. He is holy. His name is Jesus. And it's time that we arise and we go to him and say, Here I am, Lord. Send me. Here I am, Lord. I'm here, Lord, to encourage others. That's why my wife and I are here today, to encourage, to do what God called us to do, to finish it, to finish it. And that's why you're here to finish what God called you to do. And for those watching online, it's time to stop watching church online. It's time to get up and be a part of the church. Now, I love you with all my heart. I do. I don't know who I'm talking to online. But if you're just happy with watching online, there is something that needs to be addressed in your walk with Christ. And I want you to sincerely go to prayer. Talk to Him. What it is that's stopping you from being a part of the body of Christ. You know this six foot social distancing rule? Six foot. Six foot apart. Everybody six foot apart. Why six foot apart? By the way, 666, that's demonic. It's the number of men. It's the number of, it, it's, it'll be the name of the Antichrist. It'll be the mark of the beast, 666. But when all this happened, why not seven foot? Why not eight foot? Eight means a new beginning in the Bible. Seven in the Bible means completion. Ten in the Bible means testing. But six in the Bible means the mark of the beast. Is the six foot social distancing rule, is that, the, is that the mark of the beast? No. But it was implemented by men and men's ways are corrupt. And that's why I think this is ridiculous nonsense six foot where, where did this come up where did this come from five the number five in the bible it's symbolic of the grace of god it, uh, the, we can explain these things but six why six because it was implemented by men to bring division for a time such as this and god has called us to not forsake the assembly and it's time for you to wise up it's time for you to be a part of the church, to get up and start serving, to be counted front and center, to be there. Jesus said, if we're two or three are gathered, there I am also. Jesus, it's important to the Prince of Peace to be there when two Christians are gathered. And so if Jesus thinks it's important, how much more do we need to understand that's important? Because when the church is there, the, begin, the Spirit begins to move. And the Spirit is, 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 is filled with joy. 
Look, uh, Friday night, there was people here. I wasn't here Friday night. I had something I had to take care of. But apart from that, Pastor Eric and I were always here. But when I came back late, there were still a lot of people here. And I had to chase them all out. No, I'm kidding. I did it. <laughs> but I was glad. It brought, a, it brought my heart where I almost wanted to cry. Here they are, 11 o'clock at night, still at the church, laughing, having fun. That's what it's about. That's what it's about. So grace, let us, let us be about the work of the Lord. Amen? Let us encourage each other. Strengthen each other. So that way we can be of good use to God on the outside. Amen? Amen. Amen. Receive that word in Jesus' name. Give him praise. Give him praise.